chapter three of abraham lincoln a history volume eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org abraham lincoln a history volume eight by john hay and john george nicolay chapter three the march to chattanooga the army of the cumberland remained for six months on the field they had so gallantly defended at murfreesboro general rosecrans and his friends have for twenty years vehemently defended this long inactivity and general thomas in his report to congress gave the great authority of his name to the statement that the apparent lethargy of the army of the cumberland during its stay at murfreesboro was due really to the severity of the winter which rendered it almost impossible to move large bodies of men on the ordinary roads of the country and to the difficulty of procuring animals to refit the transportation and equip the cavalry and artillery but the winter was nearly half gone when the battle of murfreesboro was fought and this excuse does not explain the waste of several months of fine spring weather the government expected great results from rosecrans and his victorious army as soon as the weather became favorable and the roads fairly settled no pains were spared in giving him every possible support in supplies and reinforcements early in february a fine additional force was sent him comprising the army of kentucky under major-general gordon granger and brigadier-general charles c gilbert absalom baird and george crook these forces swelled by two regiments of infantry and four of cavalry which joined them at nashville made a valuable reinforcement of some fourteen thousand men the president and general-in-chief with friendly urgency suggested an early movement as required not only for the redemption of tennessee from the control of an enemy which was cruelly persecuting and harassing the union men of that state but also to assist the campaigns of grant at vicksburg and of hooker in virginia by withdrawing troops from their fronts or at least by preventing reinforcements against them but general rosecrans did nothing from new year's day to midsummer except to build around murfreesboro an enormous series of fortifications to exercise and drill his troops to project and carry out an extensive system of reconnaissances which led to nothing and to write a large number of spirited letters to the authorities at washington protesting against every order given him and deprecating every suggestion made to him in his evidence before the committee on the conduct of the war he made this explanation of his action when spring arrived and the roads had become settled a movement which the country expected and which would have given the officers and men of our command including myself pleasure and promised renown was proposed i felt it my duty to sacrifice all personal gratification and even to fall in the estimation temporarily of the country and friends who had high hopes and expectations of the army of the cumberland to secure general grant in his operations before vicksburg from the consequences of compelling bragg to retire when it would not be possible for us so to pursue as to prevent him from reinforcing johnston whose relative numbers to our troops under general grant was deemed more formidable than i subsequently learned it to have been it is hard to say whether this strange fancy that he could best support the campaign of grant by doing nothing and that by attacking bragg he would drive him to reinforce johnston was really the cause of rosecrans's long idleness at murfreesboro or was an afterthought to explain a delay otherwise inexplicable a better explanation may probably be found in the idiosyncrasies of rosecrans he was like mcclellan 
always demanding impossibilities from the government in the way of troops and supplies but the great difference between them was that while in mcclellan's case delay was an instinct in the case of rosecrans delay seemed to spring from a certain controversial insubordination which appeared to render prompt obedience to the wishes of the government impossible with him unless every demand of his own had been previously complied with whenever rosecrans had a disagreement with his superiors it became a fixed idea in his mind his grievance assumed proportions that were almost ludicrous and his statements became recklessly inaccurate this was the case in regard to his constant clamor for cavalry during the year eighteen sixty three he represented himself as destitute of horses when as halleck says his stables were overcrowded with animals and the horses of his cavalry artillery and trains were dying in large numbers for want of forage let it be clearly understood said rosecrans on the twentieth of march that the enemy have five to our one and can therefore command the resources of the country and the services of the inhabitants in answer to a letter from the quartermaster-general correcting his absurd understatement of the number of horses that had been sent him he admits that he has on hand eight thousand cavalry and mountain infantry of which he claims that he is not able to turn out more than five thousand for actual duty and that there were three thousand more in use as escorts and orderlies and unserviceable in nashville according therefore to his own computation he had eleven thousand mounted men and the enemy fifty five thousand a number far exceeding the force of bragg's entire army he sent general l h rousseau to washington with a request that he be allowed to recruit a cavalry force among the eastern troops recently discharged from service a request which it was not possible to comply with on account of the exigencies of recruitment in the several states but the fact that this authorization was not given him became in his mind a new grievance and a new proof of the hostility of the government towards him during his six months at murfreesboro he assailed the government daily by mail and telegraph with clamorous demands for supplies in horses men munitions and details of officers which it was not practicable to grant and he hardly ever received an order or a suggestion from the general-in-chief to which he did not reply by an argument against its execution it is altogether probable that if he had received no orders from halleck he would have moved far earlier than he did while he remained under the immediate command of grant he was in constant controversy with him and on terms of the friendliest correspondence with halleck but the moment he became independent of grant and subject to the orders of halleck as general-in-chief he transferred his animosity to the latter and sustained towards him an attitude of consistent hostility to the end of the war when he received his promotion to the grade of major-general he protested vehemently against the date of it which was the sixteenth of september eighteen sixty two and although this date was afterwards at his importunity changed to the second of march eighteen sixty two he still regarded himself as deeply injured because even this earlier date left him junior to grant the president writing to him on the seventeenth of march said as to your request that your commission should date from december eighteen sixty one of course you expected to gain something by this but you should remember that precisely so much as you should gain by it others would lose by it if the thing you sought had been exclusively ours we would have given it cheerfully but being the right of other men we having a merely arbitrary power over it the taking it from them and giving it to you became a more delicate matter and more deserving of consideration truth to speak i do not 
appreciate this matter of rank on paper as you officers do the world will not forget that you fought the battle of stone river and it will never care a fig whether you rank general grant on paper or he so ranks you and now be assured he concludes you wrong both yourself and us when you even suspect there is not the best disposition on the part of us all here to oblige you there was at this time a vacancy in the rank of major-general in the regular army and the friends of general rosencrans together with those of other meritorious officers besieged the government with the claims of their respective favorites in this conjuncture general halleck it is not known whether by suggestion of the president or of the secretary of war wrote a letter to the different aspirants saying in substance that this vacancy would be given to the general in the field who should first win an important and decisive victory as a matter either of taste or of policy the propriety of such a suggestion to generals in the field may well be questioned but no one except rosencrans thought fit to make it a subject of controversy he however with his unfailing pugnacity rose to the challenge and sent an angry and insulting reply to halleck saying as an officer and a citizen i feel degraded to see such auctioneering of honor have we a general who would fight for his own personal benefit when he would not for honor and the country he would come by his commission basely in that case and deserve to be despised by men of honor it was in this tone that most of his correspondence with washington continued upon general halleck intimating to him in a not unfriendly manner on the twentieth of april eighteen sixty three that he was using the telegraph rather too freely in reports of insignificant occurrences he answered that he regarded this as a profound grievous cruel and ungenerous official and personal wrong if there is any one thing i despise and scorn he says it is an officer's blowing his own trumpet or getting others to do it for him i had flattered myself that no general officer in the service had a cleaner record on this point than i have i shall here drop the subject leaving to time and providence the vindication of my conduct and expect justice kindness and consideration only from those who are willing to accord them it is needless to add that he did not drop the subject and that his faith in time and providence never prevented him from attending promptly to the vindication of his conduct at all times and seasons of course it is not to be imagined that the army of rosencrans on the north of duck river or the army of bragg on the south were entirely idle during this long interval the late winter and spring were occupied not only by works of fortification and entrenchment of discipline and of supply but also by a series of raids more or less expensive and destructive on both sides but leading in no case to any adequate result the responsibility of these movements does not rest exclusively upon the generals in the field they were suggested in default of more important movements by the governments on both sides of the line mr lincoln himself wrote to rosencrans on the seventeenth of february referring to the trouble and injury inflicted upon us by the raids of rapidly moving small bodies of the enemy harassing and discouraging the loyal residents supplying themselves with provisions clothing and horses and breaking our communications he said can these raids be successfully met by even larger forces of our own of the same kind acting merely on the defensive i think he continued we should organize proper forces and make counter raids we should not capture so much of supplies from them as they have done from us but it would trouble them more to repair railroads and bridges than it does us what think you of trying to get up such a corps in your army bragg certainly made great use of his cavalry but it is not at all clear that it was remunerative 
wheeler attacked fort donelson on the third of february and was repulsed with heavy loss though he succeeded in escaping with most of his command morgan was defeated by an inferior force under colonel a s hall on the twentieth of march near milton and was driven from his stronghold at snow hill by general stanley on the first of april on the other hand colonel john coburn commanding a general reconnaissance set on foot on the fourth of march was surrounded by the force of van dorn and wheeler and lost four regiments and forrest's cavalry captured some four hundred men at brentwood on the twenty fifth of march the most important of the cavalry movements set on foot by either army during the season came to equally disastrous failure general rosecrans in the month of april organized a provisional brigade of seventeen hundred men under command of colonel a d Strait for an expedition into the states of georgia and alabama to destroy property and interrupt the communications of the enemy as much as possible he was ordered to move from nashville to the tennessee river there to embark his command and proceed up the stream to form a junction with the force under general dodge then to menace tuscumbia and after having gone far enough with dodge to create the impression that the two forces formed but one expedition he was to push southward towards western georgia and to cut the railroad supplying the rebel army by way of chattanooga he was warned that this was the chief object of his expedition and that he must not allow any collateral or incidental scheme to delay him so as to endanger his return he was particularly required to restrain his command from pillaging and marauding to destroy all manufactories of arms and depots of supplies of the rebel army and to enlist all able-bodied men who desired to join the army of the union these orders were in the beginning promptly and successfully carried out a junction was formed with dodge and the national troops marched on tuscumbia defeating the confederates there dodge turned southward making a rapid raid through northern alabama and returning to his headquarters at corinth straight moved towards northern georgia but was soon attacked in the rear by forrest's cavalry he turned and fought forrest repeatedly with energy and success but of course lost at every stage of his march by fatigue and the casualties of battle his ammunition was injured in fording a stream he pushed onward however in hope of destroying at least the bridge at rome but was unable to accomplish even that much of his instructions and surrendered the remainder of his command to forrest on the third of may they were taken to richmond his men were soon sent through the lines and exchanged but he and his officers were retained and imprisoned on the ground that they had incurred the penalty fixed by the statutes of the state of georgia for inciting slaves to rebellion this caused a long controversy between the respective commissions of exchange and led later to the imprisonment of general john h morgan and his officers in the ohio penitentiary by a singular coincidence both generals made their escape from prison and returned within their own lines two months later the cavalry of general bragg attempted a similar movement upon the northern states with precisely the same calamitous result it was part of a movement of a much wider scope and was expected to yield far more important results to the confederate army than any rosecrans promised himself from the expedition of Strait. the force assigned to it was about double that of the union raiders consisting of three thousand of the best confederate cavalry which was expected to dash through the states of kentucky indiana and ohio and supported by a strong infantry force under general buckner to capture louisville and perhaps cincinnati the confederate government in spite of their disappointment over the failure of kirby smith's expedition to establish a rebel state administration in kentucky still had a lingering hope that kentucky at heart was attached to the south 
and the demonstration of the peace democrats during the early summer of eighteen sixty three and the agitation apparent at the time of the arrest of vallandigham had convinced the authorities at richmond that a large body of northern democrats were prepared to rise in insurrection against the administration of lincoln as soon as a confederate force should appear on their soil to support such an enterprise on account of the movement by general rosecrans to be narrated hereafter general buckner was unable to perform his part of the program resolved upon and the advance of morgan was therefore a mere cavalry raid more important however in regard to its numbers and its purpose than any which had hitherto been set on foot by either army morgan crossed the cumberland river at burkesville on the second of july and moved on to columbia skirmishing all the way with inferior detachments of union troops who retired as he approached he had a sharp skirmish on the fourth of july with colonel o h moore who commanded a few hundred men at green river bridge and in honor of the day handsomely repulsed the enemy on the fifth morgan captured the twentieth kentucky at lebanon after a fight of several hours burning the greater part of the town he rode rapidly through springfield and bardstown to bradenburg where he captured two small boats on the ninth of july and crossed his force to the indiana shore general basil duke the intimate friend and most trusted subordinate of morgan says that the crossing of the ohio river was in direct disobedience of bragg's orders that morgan told him bragg had ordered him to operate in kentucky but that he had no intention from the beginning to obey his orders he expected that success would condone his offense that he could carry the war gloriously into the northern states keep a large force from reinforcing rosecrans sweep through indiana and ohio recross the river at the upper fords which he had examined for that purpose or join general lee in his anticipated career of conquest in pennsylvania such dreams were common in that eventful summer and even the utter failure of his campaign does not prevent general morgan's biographer from claiming that the enterprise stamped him as a military genius of the first order the presence of so formidable a host upon the soil of a northern state naturally produced great excitement the people of indiana and ohio who had hitherto known nothing of the war except what they gained from their morning papers were at this time to have their first and only practical experience of the presence of a hostile army before their eyes and even now there was little actual fighting connected with the progress of morgan and his rough riders through these states it is no discredit to morgan to say that the expedition was merely one of thieving and arson on a grand scale for he would have been ready enough to fight had there been any fighting to do there was no organized force to meet him and the troops which were hurrying after him in hot pursuit all the way were for a long time unable to reach him as he swept the country of fresh horses wherever he went leaving his broken-down nags to be gathered up by his pursuers he rode through corydon through salem where he found several hundred home guards who made no resistance worth mentioning and were taken and paroled he burned here a railway station and ransomed the mills and factories of the place at a thousand dollars apiece the confederate historian here mentions the surprise with which morgan's men just from thinned out dixie observed the signs of thrift and plenty in the land of their enemies especially the dense population apparently untouched by the demands of the war the sight of all this evident wealth excited among them a curious outbreak of cupidity seemingly unregulated by any civilized perception of use or value general basil w duke gives this singular account of the plundering done by his own soldiers which would be scarcely credible if it were from an unfriendly hand 
the disposition for wholesale plunder exceeded anything that any of us had ever seen before calico was the staple article of appropriation each man who could get one tied a bolt of it to his saddle only to throw it away and get a fresh one at the first opportunity they did not pillage with any sort of method or reason it seemed to be a mania senseless and purposeless one man carried a bird-cage with three canaries in it for two days another rode with a chafing-dish which looked like a small metallic coffin on the pummel of his saddle until an officer forced him to throw it away although the weather was intensely warm another still slung seven pairs of skates around his neck and chuckled over his acquisition i saw very few articles of real value taken they pillaged like boys robbing an orchard i would not have believed that such a passion could have been developed so ludicrously among any body of civilized men at piketon ohio one man broke through the guard posted at a store rushed in trembling with excitement and avarice and filled his pockets with horn buttons wherever morgan went he burned bridges and public works scouring the country for miles on either hand for horses and supplies a show of resistance was made at vernon on the eleventh of july and morgan therefore passed on without attacking that place moving eastward tearing up railroad tracks cutting telegraph wires and destroying bridges he passed out of indiana into ohio on the thirteenth he came near capturing a large number of government horses and mules at camp monroe not far from cincinnati but they had been removed to a place of safety a few hours before his arrival his dangerous approach produced a great commotion in the city of cincinnati but not feeling strong enough to take the place he passed to the north threw a train off the track capturing a number of recruits and robbing the mails and resumed his ride eastward by this time it was clear that the confederates were to get no benefit from this raid except the fun to be derived from it morgan had heard of the defeat of lee at gettysburg and of the fall of vicksburg the militia of the state of ohio had been called out by governor todd and though not especially efficient as against veteran troops they were already gathering in such numbers about him as to delay and annoy his progress the confederates had now only one purpose to strike the upper fords of the ohio and effect their escape into the hill country of west virginia thus far he had not been especially incommoded by the pursuit of the union forces the indiana home guards had escorted him at a respectful distance to their state line and then returned to their homes morgan regarded them with the same indifference with which a railway train views the pursuit of a rural dog which barks at its passage until the limit of his farm is reached general e h hobson who was in charge of the troops who had crossed the river from kentucky in pursuit of morgan was never able to reach him on account of the confederate superiority in horses but as morgan approached the river the hunt became much more active and concentrated and the waters of the ohio being by this time thoroughly patrolled by improvised gunboats the matter of crossing became every hour more difficult morgan's troopers were beginning to show signs of great exhaustion and they were continually straggling and being captured by the pursuit the rear guard was constantly skirmishing and as the advance reached buffington island near pomeroy where they hoped to cross the river it was driven back by gunboats the principal force of the raiders was captured on the twentieth at this point morgan with some five hundred of his command escaped and it was only after five days of wandering of baffled attempts to cross the river at different points and a desperate ride to the northward in search of some avenue of escape that he was taken by general shackleford near wellsville just one month had elapsed since he left sparta in tennessee with two brigades of the finest cavalry ever organized by the confederate army in the west in this ride of thirty days he had destroyed his whole detachment had not interrupted for an hour 
the movements of the great armies of the union had done no damage that could not be repaired in a few days had deprived general bragg of his services at a time when he was in deadly need of them and yet so illogical is the popular sentiment where military fame is concerned he made himself by this boyish and fruitless exploit by the mere fact of wasting his command on northern soil the most popular cavalry hero of the war on the southern side being imprisoned at columbus he made his escape in the following november and was received with great enthusiasm in the confederacy but the day of his brilliant activity was over the criticisms of his fellow-officers clouded his peace of mind he came to be ill-regarded at richmond he led one more important and well-equipped raid into kentucky in june of the next year but met with a decisive defeat at the hands of general s g burbage and was driven back into virginia his command revenging itself as general duke says by great and inexcusable excesses on the fourth of september eighteen sixty four at the outset of another raid he was surprised at the village of greenville tennessee and killed as he was trying to escape through a kitchen garden while morgan's expedition was preparing general rosecrans had at last resolved upon a forward movement and was making it ready with that skill and judgment which never failed him in grand strategic operations whenever he could be brought to obey the orders of the government it had been weary work to get him started before the middle of may it had become evident that his ostensible purpose to hold bragg's force away from johnston had failed reinforcements had been sent to mississippi though not in time or in sufficient force to check the victorious march of grant across that state the government renewed its orders and its appeals to rosecrans for a forward movement now that bragg was thus weakened and it would seem as if nothing but rosecrans's obstinacy prevented his taking advantage of the great opportunity thus afforded him he made no secret of his views and it was no less his singularly attractive personal influence than the weight of his authority as commander that brought all his generals to his own way of thinking annoyed by the orders of the government to begin an aggressive campaign he called together a council of war in the first week of june and obtained from seventeen generals an opinion adverse to an advance general garfield his chief of staff alone dissented from this otherwise unanimous opinion and on the twelfth of june drew up a careful review of the opinions of the generals showing that rosecrans could throw sixty five thousand one hundred and thirty seven bayonets and sabres against bragg's forty one thousand six hundred and eighty allowing the most liberal estimate of his force and it is not one of the least remarkable traits of the character of rosecrans that after furiously opposing the views of the government and extorting from all his generals an opinion in harmony with his own he suddenly adopted the plan of garfield and set about executing it with extraordinary ability and celerity on the eleventh of june he had telegraphed to halleck the decision of his council of war and added not one thinks in advance advisable until vicksburg's fate is determined admitting these officers to have a reasonable share of military sagacity courage and patriotism you perceive that there are graver and stronger reasons than probably appear at washington for the attitude of this army i therefore counsel caution and patience at headquarters better wait a little to get all we can ready to ensure the best results if by so doing we perforce of providence observe a great military maxim not to risk two great and decisive battles at the same time we might have cause to be thankful for it at all events you see that to expect success i must have such thorough grounds that when i say forward my word will inspire conviction and confidence where both are now wanting halleck answered that the maxim quoted applied 
to a single army but not to two armies acting independently of each other johnston and bragg are acting on interior lines between you and grant and it is for their interest not ours that they should fight at different times so as to use the same force against both of you it is for our interest to fight them if possible while divided if you are not strong enough to fight bragg with a part of his troops absent you will not be able to fight him after the affair at vicksburg is over and his troops return to your front he then recalls to rosecrans another military maxim that councils of war never fight he tells him the authorities will not make him fight against his will but that after five or six months of inactivity with your force all the time diminishing and no hope of any immediate increase you must not be surprised that their patience is pretty well exhausted when this letter reached him he answered on the twenty first of june in the same spirit of controversy with however a singular shifting of his ground apparently abandoning his idea that his duty was to keep bragg away from johnston he now says that for bragg to materially aid johnston he must abandon our front substantially and then we can move to our ultimate work with more rapidity and less waste of material on natural obstacles if grant is defeated both forces will come here and then we ought to be near our base he deprecates the nation using all its force in the great west at the same time so as to leave it without a single reserve to stem the current of possible disaster having thus satisfied his controversial instinct by protesting against the plan of an advance he began immediately to put it in action he started on the twenty fourth of june ten days before the surrender of vicksburg at the very moment when according to his own theory he was bound by a policy of inaction to keep bragg in his place in tennessee and he had no sooner started than the fine weather which for several weeks had been tempting him to move broke up in a series of the most tremendous storms which had ever been seen in tennessee but in spite of all these obstacles his march was pushed forward with extraordinary energy and success the main force of the confederates occupied a strong position north of duck river their front extending along a series of fortified camps from shelbyville to wartrace their cavalry front out as far as mcminnville on the right and spring hill and columbia on the left by a skilful and imposing feint upon bragg's left wing rosecrans created the impression that his attack would be made on that side and then moved the bulk of his force upon the confederate right by way of fairfield to manchester thus turning the right of bragg's line on duck river and compelling him to fall back to tullahoma while rosecrans's right under granger drove the rear guard out of shelbyville and gave to the union force the whole of bragg's first line without resting an instant rosecrans sent a cavalry force around bragg's right and rear to interrupt his communications with the tennessee and to force a battle upon terms highly advantageous to the union army but bragg seeing that the campaign was lost gave up his whole line abandoned tullahoma and retreated rapidly through winchester across the cumberland mountains and the tennessee river to chattanooga the work of expelling bragg from middle tennessee says general garfield occupied nine days and ended july three leaving his troops in a most disheartened and demoralized condition while our army with a loss of less than one thousand men was in a few days fuller of potential fight than ever before had it not been for the storms which delayed him thirty-six hours at hoover's gap and sixty hours at winchester rosecrans says he would have got possession of the enemy's communications and forced him to very disastrous battle and this delay on account of the weather would have been avoided by an earlier movement which was perfectly practicable and which rosecrans might have made at the time that he was arguing with halleck against it his loss was only five hundred and sixty men killed wounded and missing bragg lost besides his killed and wounded which have not been reported some one thousand five hundred prisoners 
and a considerable number of guns and material abandoned in his hasty retreat but beyond all this he lost prestige which he never regained the farmers of tennessee and kentucky who had been inclined to favor the confederate cause and who had been repeatedly assured by him by buckner and by kirby smith that the yankees should not be suffered again to overrun their soil turned towards the national side when the national authority was once more established over them with a feeling in which there was as much of resentment against the confederates as of loyalty to the union this brilliant success which was an absolute negation of the theory upon which he had based his controversies with the government for six months did not encourage general rosecrans to push forward in the way which was naturally indicated he remained six weeks at tullahoma allowing bragg to tighten his hold upon chattanooga and to gather in reinforcements from all troops anywhere available throughout the confederacy garfield writing to the secretary of the treasury on the twenty seventh of july said that on the eighteenth the bridges were rebuilt and the cars were in the full communication from the cumberland to the tennessee i have since then urged with all the earnestness i possess a rapid advance while bragg's army was shattered and under cover and before johnston and he can effect a junction thus far he continued the general has been singularly disinclined to grasp the situation with a strong hand and make the advantage his own rosecrans was not unaware of the president's solicitude and dissatisfaction at this resumption of the inactive attitude of the early part of the year he wrote to mr lincoln on the first of august a long letter giving as his reasons for his previous delay the difficulty of obtaining supplies his weakness in cavalry going over once again the long controversy with halleck insisting once more on the inexpediency of the movement against bragg which would have caused him to reinforce johnston a plea which the events of the summer had completely confuted he dwelt on the bad weather and the condition of the roads insisting upon it that the roads in his department were worse than anywhere else in the world and the difficulty of supply greater he then enumerated the disadvantages of the campaign before him sixty miles of barren mountain traversed by a few poor roads bridge material brought from a great distance wide unfordable rivers for a length of five hundred miles and the difficulty of securing a crossing in the face of a strong opposition force on the other side and added to the immense difficulty of taking a position in tennessee the still greater difficulty of holding it the president answered this letter as soon as it was received in his usual tone of kindness and candor i think he said you must have inferred more than general halleck has intended as to any dissatisfaction of mine with you i am sure you as a reasonable man would not have been wounded could you have heard all my words and seen all my thoughts in regard to you after grant invested vicksburg i was very anxious lest johnston should overwhelm him from the outside and when it appeared certain that part of bragg's force had gone and was going to johnston it did seem to me it was the exactly proper time for you to attack bragg with what force he had left in all kindness let me say it so seems to me yet finding from your dispatches to general halleck that your judgment was different and being very anxious for grant i on one occasion told general halleck i thought he should direct you to decide at once to immediately attack bragg or to stand on the defensive and send part of your force to grant he replied he had already so directed in substance soon after dispatches from grant abated my anxiety for him and in proportion abated my anxiety about any movement of yours when afterwards however i saw a dispatch of yours arguing that the right time for you to attack bragg was not before but would be after the fall of vicksburg it impressed me very strangely and i think i so stated to the secretary of war and general halleck it seemed no other than the proposition that you could better fight bragg when johnston should be at liberty to return and assist him than you could before he could so return to his assistance since grant has been entirely relieved by the fall of vicksburg by which johnston's is also relieved it has seemed to me that your chance for a stroke has been considerably diminished and i have not been pressing you directly or indirectly 
true i am very anxious for east tennessee to be occupied by us but i see and appreciate the difficulties you mention the question occurs can the thing be done at all does preparation advance at all do you not consume supplies as fast as you get them forward have you more animals to-day than you had at the battle of stones river and yet have not more been furnished you since then your entire present stock i ask the same questions as to your mounted force do not misunderstand i am not casting blame upon you i rather think by great exertion you can get to east tennessee but a very important question is can you stay there i make no order in the case that i leave to general halleck and yourself and now be assured once more that i think of you in all kindness and confidence and that i am not watching you with an evil eye when this letter was received rosecrans was already in motion yet he could not let it pass without controversy he wrote defending his action in the line of argument already familiar contrasting the work required of him and the resources he had to accomplish it with that required of grant and his resources enlarging upon the difficulties of his position and saying that few armies have been called upon to attempt a more arduous campaign the president said in reply that it was not his intention to engage in an argument on military questions you had informed me he said you were impressed through general halleck that i was dissatisfied with you and i could not bluntly deny that i was without unjustly implicating him i therefore concluded to tell you the plain truth being satisfied the matter would thus appear much smaller than it would if seen by mere glimpses i repeat that my appreciation of you has not abated i can never forget whilst i remember anything that about the end of last year and beginning of this you gave us a hard-earned victory which had there been a defeat instead the nation could scarcely have lived over political as well as strategic considerations of the most imperative character demanded that the union armies should advance upon east tennessee and the president therefore exhibited some impatience at rosecrans's delay after his advance at tullahoma orders more and more pressing were given him to advance on the fourth of august he asked in his usual querulous tone as i have been determined to cross the river as soon as practicable and having all preparations and getting such information as may enable me to do so without being driven back like hooker i wish to know if your order is intended to take away my discretion as to the time and manner of moving my troops to which the general-in-chief replied on the next day the orders for the advance of your army and that its movements be reported daily are peremptory to save his own self-respect and assert his independence rosecrans waited ten days longer and then started to cover and protect his left flank in this movement and to rescue the loyal inhabitants of east tennessee from the tyranny under which they had been suffering for two years burnside was at the same time ordered to move upon knoxville the government had equal difficulty in overcoming his inertia halleck telegraphed to rosecrans on the fourteenth of july burnside has been frequently urged to move forward and cover your left by entering east tennessee he adds in a tone which has more of pathos than dignity in it i do not know what he is doing he seems tied fast to cincinnati burnside moved forward however at length and by slow marches which were almost unopposed his advance entered knoxville the first of september rosecrans had now before him the most difficult and important operation of his entire military career between him and the army of bragg at chattanooga there lay on his left flank the cumberland mountains and beyond them the rugged chain of walden's ridge which half way from bridgeport to chattanooga abuts upon the tennessee river closing access to the rocky fastness of the confederates by an almost impassable barrier if he chose to advance upon the right and strike his enemy's communications with the south he must first pass the cumberland mountains then the tennessee river and after the passage of this wide and unfordable stream had been accomplished there still lay before him the wide plateau of sand mountain and the formidable heights of the lookout range 
rosencrantz chose to grapple with the almost insuperable difficulties of the latter route but he resolved to conceal his purpose from the enemy and to create the impression on the mind of bragg that the assault on chattanooga was to be made from the north of the river and he carried out this plan with a skill and success which entitles this campaign to the foremost place among the great strategic movements of the war he sent two divisions of crittenden's corps under john m palmer and thomas j wood by parallel roads over the mountains into the Susquatchie valley pushing john t wilder's brigade of joseph j reynolds's division as far east as pike valley and r h q minty's cavalry to the northeast as far as sparta every pass of the mountains to the north of chattanooga was pervaded by this cloud of blue uniforms until bragg was convinced that an attack was to come from that side and was only in doubt whether buckner at knoxville or himself at chattanooga was the immediate object of assault four brigades under command of general w b hazen took position from williams island to kingston along the north shore of the tennessee massing their heaviest force across the river from chattanooga and the mouth of chickamauga creek this powerful feint brilliantly planned and admirably conducted completely deluded the confederate general and caused him to neglect rosecrans's principal movement lower down the river under cover of this demonstration the army moved across the mountains and began their passage of the river on the twenty ninth of august crossing at bridgeport caperton ferry shell mound and the mouth of battle creek with such expedition and good fortune that by the fourth of september all were over except hazen's troops who were observing chattanooga and a few brigades in the rear the next obstacle was sand mountain which was speedily crossed the cavalry scouring the passes in advance of the troops who hurriedly prepared practicable roads for the artillery so steep was the ascent in many places that the trains had to be doubled the soldiers assisted by hauling the guns by hand but by the sixth of september the army lay stretched along the western slope of lookout mountain from valley head a point some forty miles from chattanooga to wahatchee only six miles away rosencrans had now to choose between two movements either to cross the point of lookout mountain near chattanooga or to move over the range farther south and threaten the enemy's line of communications he decided upon the latter course and issued orders to his troops to cross lookout range by various passes the center starting from trenton and the right from valley head while the left continued to threaten chattanooga directly on the east of lookout mountain there lies a wide open valley called mcclemore's cove shut in upon the east by pigeon mountain watered by a small stream called chickamauga creek into this peaceful valley destined to be the scene of one of the most sanguinary contests of modern times general j s negley the advance of thomas's corps marched his division after crossing lookout mountain on the seventh of september through cooper's and stevens's gaps the day after crossing news had come to general rosencrans that burnside was in knoxville that buckner evacuating that place had retreated to loudon and that large reinforcements were coming from mississippi to join general bragg and while the army lay at the foot of lookout mountain indications came from various sources that bragg was in retreat a bold reconnaissance was made on the seventh across the front of lookout mountain which found the enemy in force this however did not disprove the fact of bragg's retrograde movement as a force would naturally be left in that position to cover the retreat rosencrans's sanguine temper always led him to believe that the enemy would act in accordance with his own plan and now believing that bragg was retreating he pushed his army in every direction upon his communications he ordered mccook to cross the mountain from valley head into broomtown valley starting the cavalry who were sent forward to scour the country towards lafayette and rome on the ninth the rumors continually thickening that bragg was in flight rosencrans sent a reconnaissance to summertown on lookout mountain overlooking chattanooga and ordered forward his cavalry on the right to strike the railroad between dalton and the resaca bridge but the troops on the north of the river had already discovered that their enemy had disappeared and on the morning of the ninth of september eighteen sixty three the extreme left of the army of the cumberland marched without firing a shot 
drums beating and colors flying into the mountain fastness of chattanooga the most important strategic point in the southern confederacy in spite of any inferences that may be drawn from general rosecrans's career after this day it must be said in his favor that this bloodless victory was second in importance to few military achievements during the war the popular mind sets highest value upon laurels colored by blood and by fire but nevertheless every careful student of military history must agree that there were few days of carnage in the history of this long war so valuable and so important as this apparently holiday march of the armies of the union from murfreesboro to the rear of chattanooga End of chapter three